Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. All right. Welcome to Happy Path Programming. It's a beautiful spring day in Crested Butte. We don't have any announcements. We've got just nothing, nothing no, happening. I'm still trying to just, figure out when the conference is going to be. I got to chase down the guy who the Winter Tech Forum next yeah. year. Okay, <clears throat> really going to so. try and get that date early. Yes, yes. Okay, well, let's dive right in. We have with us Trond uh, Jutelan. Did I get that at all close, Trond? No, yeah, well, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> not that bad. Not that bad. <laughs> Damning with faint phrase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I suppose you have to be from Minnesota or something. <laughs> right. There you go. All right. Well, great to have you. So, okay, I've got a topic to kick us off. Yeah. I saw in the news this week, um, there was a report that was done that said that agile projects are 200 and something times more likely to fail or something like that. I'm sure you saw this report, Tron. Give us, yeah, your, give us your take on, on this whole thing. <laughs> Now, it's an amazing number. So I almost like as a, get a bit skeptical because it's so enormously rare to the other side. But yeah, I guess uh, just, the, uh, the, uh, just the term agile projects is kind of an oxymoron in of self, kind of. So, uh, but uh, um, yeah, I have been doing agile for quite a bit. Uh, I came about and started using it in the early 2000s. I, I think I started my first real gig when the manifesto uh, came out. But, um, and the early years was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And it sort of, it was sort of felt like a grassroots thing. But um, yeah, the last 10 years or so, it's have been sort of captured by management and handled by management and enforced by management. So I think a lot of the projects that claim to be agile maybe isn't so agile. I'm not so sure. Huh. And isn't this kind of ironic because... I feel like a huge part of what Agile was about was better communication with stakeholders. Yeah. And right. now, that's, <laughs> yeah. And and maybe um, diving a little bit into a talk that we watched on your human-centered systems was that maybe Agile originally was catered around the the human needs or at least like had a like culture of being oriented to human needs but then maybe shifted to organizational uh hierarchical needs or something i don't know how would you how would you put that yeah i kind of agree but uh, i also want to bring forward that uh, for my impression at least uh, from the early days even before the manifesto the focus was a lot on process how should we work together how should we interact so it's more about the, actually to use a term from 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 open from the open so, uh, open system theory that I'm really uh, into these days, and also uh, as, sort of as part of that, which is called socio technical system design. Uh, so actually, process is a technical bit. The same with all the technology that we use to produce software, whatever whatever we want to use. But so there, that's the technical bits. But also, the, but the human bits are equally important, or should I say, more. And that is organization and how we feel about work. So mm -hmm. I feel we undervalue. We, we sort of, I feel like Agile has all along sort of looked at it to say, yeah, we have people and all that, and that's good, and we want to have self-organizing teams. But we lean on the technical bits to make that work, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we haven't sort of uh, taken into the, the fact that our social technical system is largely, the most complex part of a social technical system is the social bits. Huh. And uh, so I was curious to read up and checking out if, when I got into social science and see if, if there were any connections to the social sciences in, in the idea of manifesto and all the work that's gone, gone uh, before it. And there's very little I've been able to find. So if people have some ideas, please point me towards them. But, but I can't see that we have focused so much on that. Do you uh, think when Agile was, was kind of at the beginning of it, there was implicit or cultural human elements that were stronger. They just weren't like codified in, in the, the manifesto. So then the manifesto being written primarily about the technical bits and then management taking hold of the process pieces that eventually the kind of early culture that was, that had the human side to it, but was not actually conveyed through the manifesto or whatever, like faded away. Or is that maybe Oh, that's well put. Uh, they, again, is my impression, so it's very subjective. But um, the uh, sort of the curious thing when I read up on social technical, which is go the social technical system design, that goes back to the fifties. Like 
And uh, some claim that that's the first time we actually saw what we now call team team first based uh, organizational uh, forms. And they discovered that in the British coal mines of all places. But but the idea there was that the team themselves sort of took charge because they had to. Because if they didn't, then they literally would have a terrible day at work because they introduced like bureaucracy and, and industrialization and technical uh, technical things that sort of broke people up, so broke up the social interactions that they had before. So they had to, uh, I mean, in order to sort of actually literally survive, they had to do something. Uh, and I feel there is a connection there <laughs> in a weird, weird way, but also maybe a little weak link, but... And the first teams that started with Agile and Agile while working, they had the same impression. I have the same impression that I figured out the same things, that no management couldn't do this. And the, the big waterfall projects didn't work. And we had a terrible time at work, so we needed to do something. And then they created all these, these uh, rapid way of working and uh, short uh, the feedback loops and all that stuff. But so they started as a grassroots movement. But... You have to sort of fuel like grassroots movement in order to make it grow, and I don't think the Agile Manifesto has that bit into it. It's, as I said, it talks about self-organizing teams, but it doesn't really say how to get there. For example, or how that looks. yeah. The the thing I'm thinking is that okay, so the Agile Manifesto was written by people who you know were programmers, and they were solving their problems, and they had certain assumptions, which they assumed everybody knew. And so they didn't codify into it. So they they created to solve their problem. And then management is working on solving different problems. And so we eventually have the clash. And since management has more power, eventually it gets distorted yeah. to solving, yeah. you know, how are we going to have fungible re- humans as fungible resources and, uh, you know, maximizing shareholder value and all those kinds of things. Hmm. It always is going to get distorted that way and i think you were suggesting um a different form you know maybe i don't know i guess i think of it as a flat organization but um i think you had different terms for it yeah so uh it's exactly what you said i mean it's a systemic problem it's not something that you can easily be fixed because as you say people are measured on different things and they contradict literally so the few times I've been in, in like an Agile team or Agile project, project that actually work, I'm using air quotes for those listening, <laughs> is that, is that, is that it, that's when you have a supporter that really supports the team, that sort of shields them from all the bureaucracy. Uh, so that, and that's a very temporary thing. And uh, of, of often, more often than not, these people are, are pushed in all directions and they get tired of it after a while because they, they take a, quite a beating you know do sort of they're literally holding the tension between yeah, the are. two sides of the organization and what they the different needs and and yeah. things yeah so yeah, I, it's it, so it's kind of like the uh what is it the the dictator the benevolent dictator benevolent. and it's like that only works for the lifetime of the dictator exactly that <laughs> Also, uh, I've been on projects which really worked, but actually it was literally a project. But we were given all the free time in, in, because the, what we was creating was so complex. And so they knew that they had to get all on board and all to be able to do this. Um, so they gave us a lot of freedom. But as soon as we started slipping timelines and, and, and or deadlines, as they like to call it, uh, you know, the bureaucracy came back. And they said, well, mm-hmm. you need to take charge. And the poor boss that was above us, he was sort of uh, really pushed. So the whole thing fell fell apart. And we moved into the bureaucracy and the order and control, command and control uh, immediately again. So we became a traditional project after that. So huh. Interesting the, the, uh, how, how an organization may be able to start given that, that person who can be between the, the, the leadership in a business and the developers, but then, but then eventually there's, there's a a power struggle that that Well, if you you expand the boundaries and you go, okay, now you can work within this expanded boundary, but if you hit the edges, then of course (laughs) we can't, we got to still maintain control. Yeah. Because I think ultimately the the hierarchical organization, the goal of it is to ensure consistency. Yeah, and uh, so it's built on an it's built on an idea that really, at least as I see it, 
doesn't work for agile <laughs> or, right. or our way of working or the way we want to work. I won't use agile as a term necessarily, but the way we want to solve problems because we are designing all the time. So, I mean, we, we are not doing repetitive work like you do in a factory. So right. in a factory, you can optimize and, and make it efficient, but you can't make something efficient that you need to redo every time because it's very different every time. So there's very little, little repetitivity in it other than probably production a timeline or at, uh, it's like put, putting things into production and and uh, and sort of a certain uh, frameworks or such but the design that we make they, it's it's rarely the same thing it's... yeah you can't use the factory model on creative work no exactly. not as well as i said it's all changed it's all changed oh, and factory yeah. factory is are designed to prevent change mm, exactly so, so going back to the uh that study that talked about the number of failed agile projects. I think a lot of people would look at that and say that this is because agile doesn't work when maybe it it's more accurate to say agile works given the right environment and generally our organizations being hierarchical are not the right environment for agile. No, exactly. So just back to what sort of you hinted at earlier, which I did not, I did not really answer that uh, question. But uh, um, the sort of the theoretical framework and the experiences from social science says that you can't just leave the teams at the bottom as teams. You need to actually have everybody as teams, and it's sort of society as a more of a flat organization, but it's not necessarily completely flat because there are somebody doing different work at different levels. But there's no ordering. There's no uh, command and control from the above. It's just like they do, they work on different timescales in, in a higher. So you get a sort of a hierarchy, but they are all working together as peers. So the people at the business, uh, as usual, at the bottom works at, say, days, weeks, maybe months. But the next level, they work in months, maybe years. And then the, the sort of the strategic, uh, strategic partner at the top, they work in many years. Like they look way ahead. So, but it's all productive work and it has to be interact. It has to work together. And we ignore the top part when we do agile. I've yes. spent a fair number of years studying nonviolent communication yeah. um, right. as part, well, ultimately it came out of part of my studies of, of organizations. And um, what, what one of the primary things is people don't respond well to demands. Instead, you want to make requests, but in a hierarchical organization, I mean, the hierarchy makes demands yeah, and people is. don't respond well to that. And so what you're talking about is a system of inter, interconnected teams where people would be making requests, I would say. Yes, exactly that. And they need to negotiate. And they actually use the term uh, in sort of the uh, literature here, they use the term peers. They have to negotiate as peers. There shouldn't be any formal hierarchy that one is above another one else so so even if you work higher up in so in if you work on different uh, timescales you have no there is no bureaucracy there's no control there's no you can't say that to other people do what i say because that doesn't exist in that moment so it's a it is a basically a flat organization right and there's locality to um the you're talking about different kind of scopes of time and exactly. those being different up a hierarchy but when you're not in the hierarchy everyone should be aware of all the scopes of time and, and be a, a stakeholder essentially in that's participating in those different, different scales of time. Exactly that. And, and also you, I often get the question, uh, if we're going to have flat organization, that does mean that I as a, a JavaScript code, I need to understand all the strategies and the long-term plans and have a detailed knowledge of the market and blah, 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 blah. Not really. You need to know what's, what's, touches you and your work but i mean the big things can they, they're going to handle by somebody else but they are not controlling you they're they are, it's people you need to re relate to and negotiate with right so if there you is have, still specialization of roles but but um it's it's really about different command and control system not not roles like people can have roles that that are unique um, in in that realm, I guess you could think of it as kind of a network of servers, and yes. it's like you you make a request to a server, but you can't. The server will get to you when it is able to. <laughs> you can't tell it, yeah. No, I'm going to come yeah. over to you if you don't finish it. <laughs> this request. So it sounds like maybe there's a relationship to what's it called, open system? Yeah. Is that what's the terminology for for that? And and tell us about the biological kind of element to that. Yeah, the, the, uh, 
different worldviews, really, because open system theory actually does not see the system as a biological system necessarily. Um, it, it, it is close in the sense that you need to relate to the environment in order to survive. But like a company need to sort of figure out how to maneuver in a, in a competitive uh, environment and even more so like in a, in a social system that it has no control over. Like COVID and certainly working from home or uh, people getting tired of being told what to do, or, you know, all these social changes uh, uh, as well. But it's not an organism. That's the thing. And we have fallen into that trap to think that, that, uh, that an organism survives just by like getting information from or data or energy from the environment, which is uh, uh, what uh, like an organic uh, entity would do. You need to actually be actively working with the environment because it changes in ways that you can't predict. I mean, if you're going to be adaptive, you need to actually be uh, active in the environment. And an uh, organism generally isn't. Like you, they get adaptive to what the environment does, but it doesn't change it to their benefit necessarily. Because yeah, I guess in biological like, systems, the things that can't adapt to their environment just die. And we're, we're, you know, humans with brains, and hopefully we can find ways to adapt more effectively to the environment so that we don't just die and let, you know, something else... You had a slide um, in your presentation where uh, you said, okay, now normally we think of the organism being affected by the environment, but, but actually the system affects the environment too. And my first thought was, yeah, but how much? Yeah. Actually, in, in their view, though, in, I mean, their view, as I say, if you, if you buy into the open system theory and, and or take that on board that you are actually an open system and you, you, mean, you need to relate to everything around you and you can't predict anything, is that, is that the environment is actually formed by what you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a two-way relationship here. They even go as far as saying that the environment doesn't exist if the system doesn't exist. Huh. So, so the environment is actually defined by the systems it is an environment for, which is a tricky uh, twist of, uh, of a way of uh, putting it. But Here's just- an example of this that I think is, is kind of fascinating is I remember when Tesla was, was trying to get more EV kind of traction in the, in the broader market. And so from what I remember, and I could be wrong on some of this, they, they like opened up some of their patents to try to, encourage other companies to to enter the ev market because they knew that that by widening the whole ev market it would be beneficial for for tesla and so that i think is a really good example of this like like relationship between the 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 entity of tesla and then the broader market around it and how how in that case tesla had a huge impact on on the broader market just through that one small uh step that they took yeah, excellent example and also heard may if you're familiar with simon wardley he talks a lot about uh, amazon and amazon also does this quite consciously i mean they are way ahead they are like decades ahead of us of, of their competitors because they see what's coming based on how what what is being used right so they can actually maneuver they can also, they, I think they do the same thing. Make, make a thing open source just to push it towards that commodity so they can build on top of it. So it's a, there's a, so much strategy here that is fascinating. So they, they without using necessarily this uh, way of thinking, they actually have probably taken this on board quite considerably. The idea that you have to be actively uh, changing the environment. In order You're not just a, a organism living in an environment with no ability to affect it or, or adapt to it. You, it's, it's much more of an open system and yes. the environment is part of that open system. Exactly that. So, uh, and also that's also why uh, this other, uh, like you said, uh, I didn't go into that, but uh, uh, the open system theory defines like two organizations models. They say there is only two genotypical models. It's either the bureaucracy, which is a command and control hierarchy thing, the, the, the deep um, autocratic hierarchy, or we have a f- more flat organization but still consisting of teams. So in one model, it's the individual that is the, the smallest unity. In the other one, it's the team. There are individuals in the teams, but it, you always look at the teams, this team first kind of thing. Um, so the idea is that when we have a bureaucracy, we need, uh, in order to <clears throat> adapt to an environment, you need to have all the expertise of, on, on, on the people that, that actually works for the environment. And if you treat the teams like just a set of feature teams, they are not allowed to talk to the customers. They are not allowed to do this and this and that. They are not being adaptive. It's the other parts of the organization that needs to be adaptive. I mean, in, uh, 
uh, and in a high, in like a, a deep hierarchy, it, it puts an enormous pressure on the higher ups because they are the ones that are able to do this control and and, and uh, goal setting and, and coordination, all that stuff. So, in order to manage, they need to to say, okay, we have one way. <laughs> don't don't be creative here now because we have figured this one out. Don't change anything. So, so the bureaucracy is very brittle. Uh, it doesn't take changes easily. Well, the other one. It, there is only the team that can do it. So the teams need to be ex- fully exposed to, to them. They need to relate to the customers that, 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 they, that they sort of built there and that have services for and all that stuff. That doesn't, as I said earlier, they don't necessarily have to have sort of the, the, the broader view, but I need to be do enough to manage what they do. Uh, they can't lean on other bodies. Yes, they can't call in their grown-ups to help them if something goes wrong, for example. They have to take this on board themselves. Then. So it's much more adaptive to uh, changing environment. So I, I have a very difficult question for you. Um, I have a friend who's a, a, a historian, and he's been explaining to me, you know, how uh, the original Karl Marx and Engels were were defining communism. And one of the things that I noticed is that they defined this system in its ideal steady state, mm. and. Uh, and I've also noticed this about uh, like holacracy and flat organizations in general. We're defining, oh, here's the great system and, and, and how it's working. But they, like in particular, you know, Marx didn't talk about how do we get there? Um, and it was just, there was a whole lot of magical thinking there. And so when, when say, Russia or whoever tried to implement it, they just go, oh, we'll, we'll force, you know, we'll use a... A uh, hierarchical uh, power system to just you know, and they would just put people in places, and they go, "Okay, you now have the capability of doing this job," and they didn't. They had no right. experience, et cetera, and the whole thing was a disaster. And so, whenever I've tried to describe any kind of a you know flat or non-hierarchical organization to people, the question is usually around the details. Well, how do we? hire and fire? And how do we, um, you know, basically, how do you get there? So have you spent time thinking about the transition and whether it's even possible? Yeah, exactly that. Uh, no, it's a, um, I guess that's where I, in a weird way, fell in love with the whole idea of open system theory. One is the, the geekiness of all the theory, because I enjoy that. It's, it's fun. It's, it, it's, uh, it feels comfortable to have, have a sort of uh, kind of uh, understandable foundational thing. But uh, what they have spent most time on is producing these practices in order to get there. As you say, there's a um, that's the hard part. And one thing is mm-hmm. like figuring out or the theory and sort of uh, listening to and seeing what companies are doing and who is failing and who is not failing and what's the difference between them. So that's that's sort of one thing. But they go further. They want to do what they call action research. They want to figure out what practices actually work. So even back uh, from as early as the 60s, they started experimenting with different techniques uh, because this isn't trivial. The, that if, if you want to move from, uh, say, if you have a bureaucracy and move into a, the other more democratic uh, team-based organization, that's, uh, they call it a DNA change. And it's not like you shouldn't take that lightly. It's a huge man- mental shift that companies have, have to do. So they have produced two techniques. One is for dealing with the environment, which they call a uh, search conference. Uh, for the, for the, maybe you and maybe some of my listeners have heard something called future search, which is, a, which is an Americanized version of it by Viceboard. Uh, there are some, some agile coaches that uh, use that. Uh, there are differences between the two, but they are, they are designed to be a workshop where you, can, uh, where you to collectively can sort of figure out how to fit in the environment. It's basically what we discussed earlier, right? How to be adaptive, what should you do? What sort of changes do you have to do in the environment in order to be adaptive and all that stuff? Uh, so that's a search conference. So that's more of a strategic planning kind of thing. But they also have something they call participatory design workshop. And this is the one I wish Agile takes on board. Uh, and this is where people themselves design the work they should do. There's nobody else higher up in the hierarchy in the bureaucracy that should design it. They should do it themselves. So they have the final kind of streamlined process in order to do this. They look, you look for like how you feel at work. You measure sort of the internal motivators that the, the, the members of the team have just to figure out how they're doing. And you might measure the, the, I mean, the skill matrix that you have or the, all the variants that they need to deal with. 
and then they do a redesign themselves and do a new, new test of like how would this work for us? What sort of changes do we have to do? What sort of competence would we have to bring in? What are we missing? So there's nobody else doing the design. They are doing it themselves. And the, and the belief is that the people doing the work are the best one equipped to actually design how to do the work. <laughs> That's the idea. How easy it is now. And what do the managers do? They're like, I'm, so, I'm out of a job. <laughs> yeah, that, and and it has been shown that in large, like old organizations where you have, you know, bureaucracy, our management level tends tends to build up. It's not something that you can't you can't get rid of it as soon as you have it. It sort of just expands and expands and expands. I usually pat pat my belly when I say that. It's like the middle fat <laughs> on your body. <laughs> Um, so uh, I heard conversations say that there's fire all day. Not in this model, but I heard other conversations do that. Oh, they get rid of all the middle managers and start again, almost like a greenfield. But in in this approach, they are invited in to do the participant design works as anyone else. So they, but they need to choose then at some point. Should I be part of the design of the team and do the work together with the team members as a peer, or do I still want to control people and be a manager? Maybe I need to go somewhere else. To find that, so they have it has shown in a lot of experiments and a lot of places where they have done this is that middle management there there is a there is a considerable uh, not layoff but people leave if so there there is no there's no no layoffs there people choose what they want to do and there is a there's a considerable amount of managers that figure out that this is not the place for me anymore so that happens. And I, I would think one of the biggest challenges with transitioning a organization in this way would be that because decisions are made from the top down, if there there likely won't be a manager somewhere in that hierarchy that says, hey, I got a great idea. Let's switch to this whole new system, with, which makes it so that I'm no longer needed. Yeah. Like that just doesn't seem why like- Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, why would you do that? You risk your job. No, exactly that. Eliminate uh, your job. And that is the big crux of the whole thing, to be honest. Um, what the what sort of the uh, what I've gotten from the papers and sort of the consultant that has done this or help companies do this transition is they they come to them when there is nothing else they can do <laughs> in order to survive in a moment of crisis <laughs> exactly dire needs. So examples from Australia, for example, where the competition from China was so enormous that they had to do something. If they didn't do anything quick, they would just be out of out of business. So they had to do something, and so they started with Lean and then ended up doing social techno redesign. So uh, they managed to actually stay alive for quite a bit after that. So it seems like there has to be a certain amount of pressure from the all the way from the top that they need, something needs to be done. So it, it you probably would never see it sort of origin originating in the middle of an organization, either the bottom or the top. top probably. Yeah. yeah. I think so, there's... I think agile... I think we need to make it a serious grassroots movement if you want to make this change, I think. Or get yeah, some I feel like a lot of this comes back to culture. And and like in your talk, you said, oh, well, some of this stuff just doesn't fly in America because everybody's, you know, got this individualistic and they all want to be their own whatever. And, you know, and it's like, yeah, I think that's what we're looking at is a change in culture when when i sometimes when i would suggest these ideas to people who are very educated and thoughtful and they would say well who tells you what to do yeah exactly and it's just so ingrained yeah and to change that i think i mean there there are things that we can change but then there are things that are more like darwinian evolution where oh, this organism doesn't fit anymore and we have to wait for a new organism to come along that does fit. Yeah. And I know uh, one of the guys, who, uh, so one, one, one of the main characters in, in, in the, in the uh, research here called Fred Emery, an uh, Australian, I think he uh, referenced Max Planck, I think it was. He used, he used to say that the, the science progresses one death, one funeral at a time. <laughs> that you need sort of the old people out, to, of course, you can get the new ideas in. I mean, it's a, it's a bit tongue in cheek, of course, but uh, there is something to that. Uh, I think you need new management, new way of thinking in order to make the changes in certain cultures. Um, yeah. And if you have a fundamental culture of, oh, I will find the answer mm-hmm. and then I'm going to hang on to that. And you see that with scientists, you know, they. They they will just hold on to their thing for the rest of their life, and until we, we and until we kind of 
are able to change the metaculture to where you go, oh yeah, I see a new thing and I can change to that. And I think computer science is maybe moving us in that direction because it does change constantly and you, you have to just get used to adapting. Hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, actually also one one of the interesting things have been when I met the researchers, there was at least at least one in Australia that's still alive and do this uh, actively, that that was part of the movement in the 50s and the 60s, or at least 60s and 70s more likely. But uh, but uh, but she is really keen on getting the IT industry on board because you see there is a there is a cultural difference between people who work in the IT industry and do, for example, manufacturing. And uh, if you can imagine the bureaucracy and command and control in IT, it's way worse in, in manufacturing, probably, right? Um, so we, there is we do a- have some advantages with, with the software realm in this regard, because we can, maybe not in all domains, but in a lot of domains, we can have interactions with our users. We can have uh, quick iterations. We like, there is... There is a lot of things that are different and make software a much better fit for this. Plus, we know that everything is made up. We invented yeah. everything. And it's not like, oh, well, yeah, here's how this machine works. And that's just yeah. the end of it. Yeah. But we made all this stuff up. And you go, oh, well, we did change it. We, can we make, made it up. We made it up. We, yeah, if it's it. not working, we can make up something else. Yeah. Yeah. And also, there is another factor, I think, because it's so expertise based. Which is, uh, which is which actually in itself is a bit of a challenge if you want proper cross-functional teams because there's always going to be some expertise that you need. So you can't multi-skill, for example, as easily. But there is something to the fact that uh, the experts are sitting at the factory floor, so to speak. If you have some expert coder going up the hierarchy, I mean, there is a reason why we have the Peters principle, right? <laughs> the higher you go, the less yep. uh, competent uh, you are at your, at your work because you... You're being promoted for something that you were good at, and then you have to do something else. So uh, at some point, they they sort of lose the connection to what's going on at the bottom floor. So it's it's really hard to control it in detail from above, even though projects or waterfall projects actually do try, and architects, yeah, Ivory architects try, and you know there are still attempts at this. But I think we all know that you need the people on the floor on and in your projects actively doing what they should do all along, right? They should collaborate and figure things out and design themselves and all that. So I think there are there are certain cultural changes that can happen here and actually partially have been happening since, since the late 90s and 2001 with the Agile Manifesto. But I think cultural changes only come through direct experience. Like, as an example, the conference that we've been running up here for I don't know how long has it been. Twenty years, 20 years yeah, something like twenty years. So it's a, it's a an open spaces conference, and there are some people who come in and just immediately say, "Well, this can't work." Actually, I had some of that myself initially, and and you go, "Oh, it can't work." And then even some people, after they see it work, they'll say, "Well, that could only work with these people." Yeah. And, you know, there's so much resistance to to these, uh, e- even when they actually have the experience, sometimes they'll still resist it. Actually, uh, I usually bring up open space uh, as an example of where you get close to what they in, in, in this uh, opposition theory calls uh, DP2, which is the democratic. Uh, DP2, democratic. you said. Yeah, because it's the, it's just a name. So it's a design principle two, <laughs> and the bureaucracy mm-hmm. is design principle one. So it's just a, a tag. But um, and also open system theory OST and open space technology OST. So there's <laughs> <that. laughs> one. No, but, uh, it has the same ideas. Right? It it is a collaborative model. It's where there is there is no you collaborate as peers. When you go into an open space conference, there's nobody telling anyone what to do and what they should talk about. And- Except there is a basic, you know, there is a fundamental structure. Yeah, it's just a- very broad. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So- yeah, and that's what uh, DP2 is too. There's a, uh, you, most of your listeners probably heard this, oh, uh, Agile can't work because, the, I mean, there's no structure. <laughs> there's no enforcement. There's no... Well, it's way more structured. There's way more enforcement. Because you have every eye in the team watching hmm. it. So, uh, and the same with not structureless. It not just is a totally different. It's just not enforced from above. It's yeah. enforced from within, and and that's a weird concept for people. It is. 
And of course, there are risks there as well with groupthink and all that stuff. But uh, I think it's, uh, I would rather have that than somebody with less knowledge than me telling me what to do, to be honest. There's also this illusion that there's some way that we can prevent projects from failing. And so, oh, and, uh, you know, obviously, if, if a project is going off the rail, we have to impose, you know, a hierarchical system on it. And it's like, well, it can just as easily fail then. And I would certainly rather have a, a really good experience. And I think there's a, the, I mean, in my mind, there's a higher chance that you could recover if, if you know, your team is doing the decision making. Exactly. Hmm. I think what the, the one challenge to that is that in DP1 bureaucracy, failure can be really easily redefined to mm -hmm. become success. And, and so it's, I think that's harder when you're, when you're in DP2 land, because the people then know what success actually is, not what management has told you. Success and you is. have to take responsibility. Whereas in a hierarchical system, the the manager can claim success and then move on before the failure is actually discovered, which we exactly. have seen again and again. Yeah, that's so common. So there's another benefit to keeping the hierarchy for the people who are in power. Yes, exactly. That. So, uh, so I'm I'm a deep believer of of the fact that when you get these these this sort of interaction and people are engaged and actually do their own design. I think there is a, isn't there a, not a fallacy or some sort, but it's called an Ikea effect. When you build it yourself, you're so proud of it. Oh, we <laughs> can say that again, the I, what effect? Yeah, Ikea effect. Like Ikea, the, yeah. Ikea. Yeah. I think that's when you build your own, or I have the best cupboard because I built it on myself, right? So uh, you get all the engagement and actually also commitment that, people are missing and they oh we need we need we need to be more committed to our plans and we need, I mean accountability and all that stuff so you can easily get that when people are doing their own design you would you would actually fight for your design if you really truly uh, believe in it if you're just given one by some architect somewhere you can also well it works then perfectly i did a good, uh, good job if it didn't work i can blame the architect <laughs> mm -hmm. well i think this is an important point because i think in the in the bureaucracy driven organization DP one style, we've generally not considered the like health and needs of the humans in the system. And I think you talked about this in the in the talk. But it does seem like like you would have to elevate in the DP two system the human needs and the human aspect to it, um, because like. I don't know. It just seems like like that's a, a fundamental difference between the two systems. And I think back to our conversation about like failure with Agile and DP1, I think very rarely in those style of systems is how is the team? Are they healthy? Are they getting along? Are they treating each other with kindness? Are they are is each individual getting what they need but out of it? But they're parts of the machine, <laughs> and if they're a problem, you you replace them and all that. Whereas in a creative system, it's like, well, yes, the health of the individual is going to directly okay. affect how creative they can be. Right. Exactly. Right. That's why also I uh, sometimes go as far as saying agile teams really aren't that um, deep two like as we probably would like them to be. Because as you say, they are parts of a mechanistic way of thinking. And that's why I go back to what I said earlier. Agile had a lot of focus on process and roles. Exactly. Like, for, for example, Scrum. And I know some people would say that uh, Scrum is not agile at all, but I'm not going to go there. But uh, but there are defined roles, right? So so uh, there is still some individualism there. There's no, there's not, there's not, it's not flat. And there is this hero Java programmer and this perfect uh, UX expert. And so it's very individualistic still. And that's where in DP2, you try to get rid of that as well, um, because you want everybody to be on board. And the only way they have figured out to measure how people actually are doing is to actually ask them, how do you feel at work? And they have six criteria, so intrinsic motivators that they so, so you, you can easily uh, measure. And you get terrible scores on DP1, good scores on DP2. That's, that comes on again and again and again. So uh, you can actually measure then how well the teams are actually doing instead of not just their output, but how, should it, how well the people are doing. That is, that's really interesting, you know, because you think, oh, well, do your self-evaluation. 
but the idea of, well, how are you feeling is not part of that. (laughs) I don't think I've ever been asked that in any of my jobs. (laughs) And how many retrospective have you been asked that? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Oh, there might be like a, like a, like a, what do you call a icebreaker at the beginning? When you some point off some cats or something, how do you feel today? And then you point them out. Cat, cat, cat. I've only seen one retrospective done, and Esther Derby did yeah, it. I heard that. And it was all about how are you feeling in this point <laughs> at that point. And it's like there was great feedback from that. You know, really. Can you give us as many of the six uh, oh, that you can remember? remember. <laughs> <laughs> a six is above three, which is the nine. Yeah. So I have yeah. to keep them all in my head. Now, uh, the first one is elbow room. Uh, they were originally called that uh, autonomy, but I sort of kicked that term out. I'm glad I did. Uh, you know, you probably, some of you probably know Pink and his uh, the three so, so autonomy, three. mastery, purpose. But I see what you mean when you say because autonomy has to have something that you're autonomous yes. from. So it's, I see why you did that. It's an emergence of something, right? It's not. Yeah. It's, you can't just put that in there. Same with empowerment and psychological safety is the same thing. You can't just put it in there, culture. So there has to be something that actually forms it. And the elbow room is one where you have something that you feel is yours. There's something that you're responsible for, that you feel accountable for, even if you want to go that far. So that's one. <clears throat> uh, the second one is, is that, that you want to continually learn. Uh, so you don't want to be stuck doing the same thing. That also goes to the third, which is variety. Uh, that again, you want you, you want to do different things. You want you don't want every day to look the same. But also going back to uh, learning is that learning is not just learning new techniques or learning new information or whatever. It's actually also being able to set your own goals and get the feedback from that. You want to learn by the design that you're doing. That, it, that just didn't what we're doing here actually works. That is also a learning cycle. That that is something that we want to have. So that's the first three. They are more personal and uh, when you measure these you don't want you don't want to max it out you want to have some there is a balance and everybody has a balance no somebody enjoy more work the variety than others and so it's all it's all about the individual and even varying from day to day probably for some people for me at least it does so it depends on which leg i stand up on <laughs> get out of bed <laughs> uh, the next three are um are um, meaningfulness this is the how meaningful does the work feel to you? How do you feel like it has a social need? Is is the is there something that you that you you can be proud of that you can tell people in the pub that I'm doing this and I'm so proud? So that's the meaningfulness of it. And then you have mutual support and respect, which is within the team and also across teams to other peers that there is a mutual respect between all of you. There's again that's a, the explicit saying. There's no hierarchy. That you there's always a full. You are peers uh, working on the same thing in the same boat together. And the last one is really interesting. That is uh, uh, like a desirable future, I think they call it. Because uh, what, say again, desirable future. But you want desirable some, future. Okay. You want this job to lead somewhere. And um, uh, the uh, classical way of thinking where job leads you in a bureaucracy that is usually up the hierarchy. <laughs> yeah. You want a higher paying paying job. You want more responsibility. You want for yeah, I mean, basic, probably more mostly pay, though, must be said. Uh, so, But you can't have that when it's a flat organization. So how do you deal with that? And the companies that have done this, what they have done, figure out that, okay, you can't go up the hierarchy, so how can you more feel that you progress? And at the same time, how can you make a, make a system that makes you feel like you're getting somewhere, but at the same time are true to the other principles? Huh. So they often end up with pay by skill. That the more you learn, the more stuff you can do without necessarily doing it every day, the more pay you are, you're going to get. So if I, as a programmer, a Java programmer, if I learn some UX design, if I learn how to interact with the customers, la la la, and different things, then I get a higher paying job because I know more. And that also goes back to the fundamental difference between DP1 and DP2. And that is, no, and I'm getting theoretical here, but every system needs to have a some redundancy in it. In, a, mm. in, the, in, in the bureaucracy, if somebody gets sick, then you need to be able to replace that person quite quickly, right? Or if somebody leaves or the bus factor or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's where there's a redundancy of parts. You can replace people, which is, again, tricky in an IT organization because there's so high expertise. So try to get an equally good Java programmer when you lose the best one. It's not easy, right? It's going to hit the team quite hard. In the other one, there's a redundancy of functions. Is that the more you know how to do, 
the more you can actually replace the other person that goes on a sick leave or whatever, right? You can help them out. The team can sort of collectively help each other out. So you're into the whip thinking and all that kind of niceness also here. Then. So it sounds big... like an organization that I want to work in. I yeah, mean, exactly. is, is there many programmers that would hear those six things and be like, eh, not for me? Yeah, yes. you said that, oh, the first three are more personal, but they all sound personal to yeah. me. Yeah. In the end, they do, actually, yes. I mean, you yeah. want then you want to, and 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 that is actually one of the the sort of core ideas between like and from a social sciences perspective is the idea that as I said earlier that the basic unit of society is no longer the individual it is the person is the group, and that is and the claim there is or the sort of insight is that we grow through others we don't we can't be successful unless we are with somebody else we learn and we grow through others is sort of the the idea then. So we are, uh, we are the, 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 what they say is that we are an open system, <laughs> we as people, but we are open purposeful pers- 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 system uh, in relation to an environment, which is other people. Huh. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah it is. So coming back, one of the thoughts that I've been having is that this, this study that, that talked about the, the failure rate of agile, it seems like maybe agile and I don't know who, but the world of agile needs to pretty clearly delineate agile in DP1 organizations from agile in DP2 organizations. Hmm. And agile in DP1 is like agile islands. Mm-hmm. And there, if you try to have these agile islands, hmm. you have to admit that that there are some significant trade-offs. That is not the best environment for agile to thrive in. And then we need a term for agile and DP2. Hmm. And maybe it's just like, maybe what's hard is that maybe going back to the original conception of agile, agile was kind of at least culturally conceived of in a DP2 style realm. And so that is like the heart of agile, but it almost seems like it's time for a redefinition of agile in DP2. And and to clearly be able to delineate, yeah, those agile projects that have that high failure rate are agile islands, not this new, or not even new, but but uh, um, OG agile or something integrated or something. Yeah, yeah, I think there are very few agile. Uh, I hate to use the word project, but they are not DP two. Most of them are what I in social science call mixed mode where you actually try to sort of, you have the bureaucracy and you try to say, you try to have some pockets of agility at the bottom and just hope that you can isolate that so much that people actually enjoy it and do proper agile uh, approaches or thinking. But uh, as we said earlier, it it is a very brittle system. And uh, the research going back quite a few years said that the mixed mode is probably the worst. (laughs) It's the the worst way that you could do agile. Well, especially if you're not aware I've been following this guy recently who who makes a real distinction between complicated and complex. And complicated is like, oh, it's a machine or a watch or something. And it's weird and messy, but there, you can set up rules to figure out how to make this work. And complex is like the weather or like a six-year-old or like a whatever, where you can go, oh, they seem to be in a mood today or they seem to be doing a direction, but you can't, you can't accurately predict it or you and you can't control it and the problem is that i think from you know scientific management is the idea that oh everything is com- complicated and we can always come up with rules and so they end up as this guy puts it shouting at the weather <laughs> yeah oh the nice about the simpson <laughs> no old man to shout that's uh, at the cloud or at whatever. the cloud yeah <laughs> Yeah. And I think, well, and the problem is, I mean, he says he'll go into companies and they're treating everything as complicated. And, he, you know, he has to kind of say, OK, you're applying. And I, w- what I was bringing it back to is that mixed mode. And you say, yeah, the mixed mode is like the worst of all possible worlds. And I think it's because you get one mindset. Oh, we can control everything. Mm-hmm. And then there are things that don't work that way. And then you just fight against them. Yeah. Actually, uh, I had I had to write up a little short blog post on this because I see it as it's actually more fundamental than we probably think it is. It's almost like we have different worldviews. 
But people yes. who think that you can predict the world, that think in order, and they, we just have to find the right model because it's out there. We just have to find it. We'll have to have the correct people on board or whatever because it's uh, uh, there is always a way, right? The, the, we can make any complex system into a complicated one. It's just we just need to put our brains together, and that's how we're going to fix it. While the other one, like open system theory, that's more a mechanistic way of thinking. Well, the open system theory would say that you can't. There's no way. <laughs> it's all Which we don't like to hear. No, no, because it feels terrifying, right? Oh, yeah. If you're a project manager and have a deadline and a budget and, you know. <laughs> so that's why the mixed mode is so terrible, is that you, you end up believing that you can do it somehow, but then the world hits you in the face. <laughs> that S takes the plan, if you like. <laughs> right. So, I feel uh, like my whole life has been kind of a transition this way because when I was young and studying physics, I didn't understand it because I thought, oh, there's answers for everything and, you know, the equation is real and it's not just a model and all that. And it's only in my later years that I began to realize, oh, and, and it's so hard to let go of the idea that, oh, I can control everything because some things you can control. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, well, I want everything to be that way. And it's such a difficult transition to make. So really what this is about is the agile illusion that agile gave management this illusion that they could control everything and get expected outcomes. And it turns out that actually at the heart and the origin of agile was that is not at all what the, what the uh, world view of agile was. It's kind of an extension of scientific management. Yeah, it is. That was the same illusion. Yep. Same. Well, uh, real well, well put. And also it, it reminds me of, uh, a job I got in 2010, I believe, after a few years of doing Agile and thought it was fun because we were doing it as teams and management really didn't care. As long as we delivered, um, they were happy, happy. If we pair program or not, they didn't bother with that. Uh, but suddenly when I started a job in 2010, I, the, CA, the CTO came over to me, you, <clears throat> you know what, uh, we don't have and people doesn't work in Agile here. Should we implement that? So that's when the oh the alarm bells go off. I, I didn't it didn't go off, but I thought oh that was nice. Of course we're going to try that, but I should have seen that coming. <laughs> that was all about uh, trying to figure out using the new way of working to get an improvement and still controlling it. So and that. Mm. So red flag if management is like we're not hitting our deadlines, uh, agile can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be well, the, the key phrase being fix it, just the <laughs> idea that everything can be fixed. Yeah, there's a, in the there's a show that I really love called The Good Place. I mean, they, it ran for four seasons, but um, towards the end, they show that the the moral philosophy professor, Chidi, he has gone through life believing that there is an answer for everything and all he has to do is work hard enough to forget it, to to, to discover it. And uh and it's taken me several viewings to really get that. It was like, oh my gosh, he's me. That's what I was doing. I thought, yeah, there's an answer for everything. Uh, yeah, I have I the same same uh, background. I come from natural sciences myself, uh, astrophysics, and and when I when I stood in IT, I, I treated the world as even closely as super deterministic. Even oh, well, there's a there's a cause and effect to everything, and then, you know, we just don't know everything yet. So, but someday we will. <laughs> like the, one of the tensions. <laughs> one of the tensions is that we're programmers. We yeah. control computers, and so there's this imagined world where I can control the world or well, my, think my about world. The foundation of digital, you had this char transistor characteristic curve. And what we did is we forced it to be either this or this. And that made everything under our control. Whereas the characteristic curve is all wonky. <laughs> it turns it's out like, it's actually analog under the cover. Yeah, well, it is. We've, yeah. It's just we've that just... we forced it into this digital mm. um, domain. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's like, so why can't we just force everything into exactly. a binary, easily controllable system? Yeah, and that, but but that underlying mindset that you know that is deep in our culture, which is that yeah, we 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 master the world, <laughs> we and we can control everything, and that is so hard to let go of. It's it's a it's a fundamental change in your psychology. Mm -hmm. And I also would suspect that it's a, it becomes extra confusing for us, as per, at least when I, do, when I did the program, because as you said, uh, if you think in complexity and complicatedness, 
right? We want to do, we work in complex, in complicated, oh, sorry, in complex stuff, right? The environment and, and also the, the users and the needs and everything. And we need to squeeze that down into a system that is complicated. That's right. And so it is a tough job. Uh, and making that transition there, right? I mean, that's where we're struggling probably making good products. Is that we, we haven't figured quite out how to do that. And Agile, at least, that make that do a massive strides in the right direction. But I think we need to push the lead a little bit further so we can actually enjoy work better, more than we do today. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, that was a good thought to end on. <laughs> I think <laughs> somebody so. has something else. I think so. I don't know how we're going to. Top that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that was fascinating. Really appreciate that, Trond, and thanks for your thoughts on all that. It was uh, illuminating. Oh, you see, I can go on and on uh, about this. <laughs> I think we need it. It's in due time. We need to not fix Agile, but we have to create something more that it's founded on the Agile ideas because I think they are still sound. True okay. Agile. That's what we're aiming for. Mm. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>